This is the fourth session of the interpretation of the Tao Te Ching by me, Gabriel Ram, through the conscious way. Number four. The Tao is an empty vessel. It is used but never filled. O oh, unfathomable, unfathomable is uncomprehended. O oh, unfathomable source of ten thousand things. Plant the sharpness, untangle the knot, soften the glare, merge with the dust. Oh, hidden deep, but never present. I do not know from whence it came. It comes. It is the forefather of the gods. I read uh, this sentence first of all, um, more or less like the first time I heard it before and read it before. But when I come to interpret it, I must uh, admit that it presents itself, first of all, as a riddle. Yes. Um, uncomprehendable. Um, is it also with you? Yes, totally. Totally. Okay. So, I will read it again and I will see if I find an entry port to actually open up um, this uh, encrypted uh, um, um, piece of writing. It's very interesting also uh, to try to find out why it is written in an encrypted way. Yes. Is it meant to be written this way or is it just it's a way of writing? The Tao is an empty vessel. It is used but never filled. O oh, unfathomable source of ten thousand things, blunt the sharpness, entangle the knot, soften the glare, merge the dust. O oh, hidden deep but never present, I do not know from whence it comes, it is the forefather of the gods. Okay, after the third time, it's not more comprehensible, but I will try to get into it. Um, it starts with a statement, then there is turning an address towards something which is called the unfathomable source of 10,000 things. And the address is a request. Again, in the beginning there is a statement. The statement about the Tao, what is the Tao? Simply a statement. The Tao is an empty vessel. Well, now, we think of an empty vessel as something which is being filled by something. It says, no, this is an empty vessel which is never filled. Which is okay. We say, fine, empty vessel, never filled. I have vessels at home, I never fill them. But then he puts in between something curious. It says, the Tao is an empty vessel. It is used, but never filled. So we are in front of something which is a bit like the burning bush. Yes. Um, how can something uh, be, be filled, be used, and yet stay empty? So he puts it as a, as a statement, and then he goes to address something, something above himself, the speaker, the person who writes this thing, he says that that thing which I'm addressing is uncomprehendable. Can't comprehend it. 
and this thing is the source of 10,000 things. So there is something which is not comprehensible and there is many, many things that come out of it. Yes. Which means we live in a seen world, in a phenomenon world. Uh, we meet lots of phenomena. Behind it there is something which is there but is beyond, beyond our perception. And I, the writer, address it. So, in the beginning there is a statement about the Tao whatever it is, then there is address to something which is responsible for seeing phenomena, and then there is the request, that this, the third part, statement, address, and a request from the person who is being addressed. First of all, he says to us, whom am I addressing? And then there is the request. And there is actually four requests. So that person goes to that great power, which is uncomprehendable, and it asks four things. Please blunt the sharpness. So it is a complaint. He's saying there's 10,000 things here, and things are sharp. They are edgy. They are piercing. They are unpleasant. Blunt them. Then he says, Untangle the knot. My life is full of knots. It's complicated. It's complicated. There's things which I could not uh, untangle. Please untangle them for me. It's a kind of a prayer of a person who feels in a cool de sac. Mm -hmm. And then he says, soften the glare. Now, what is exactly is a glare? There is when you stare at something. Sort of a stare, that's what I thought. So, things for him are too direct and too concentrated and tense. Things are staring at him, they are not and they are sharp. It is a person who lives in a cruel, difficult, attacking, hard world. And then comes the fourth thing, which is kind of strange again, merge with the dust, which is a strange request. I can understand, soften the glare, untangle the knot, blunt the sharpness, but merge with the dust. The other three is something that you need to do to change something, to change the glare, to change the knot, to change the sharpness. But here it goes, merge with the dust. It's like disappearing. Yeah. There's a disappearing sense to it. Yes. Like things are concentrated, they've got specific shape and form, and the speaker, the writer, wishes that power to allow him to be merged with little particles which are unseen. Yes. So the whole feeling of the four requests, the feeling for wish for expansion, to get out of certain cell, prison, hardness, sharpness, things are directed towards him and demand and an attack and he wants to disperse. A kind, I would say, disperse maybe with the universe, dust, it's more a feeling of space. So we have the statement, we have the, the address, we have four requests, and then he has the address again. Oh, hidden, deep, but never present. Which is like the first statement, oh, unfathomable source of 10,000 things. So again, he's talking to someone, but now he's more specific. He's saying, you hide yourself. You are never here. A bit of complaint. So he, this is the second address. And then it finishes again with a statement, but this time a personal statement. If in the beginning it was a general statement, the Tao is an empty vessel, 
it's used but never filled, it ends with a personal statement. After he opened himself up and he's complaining and he's coming with requests, he's saying, I do not know from whence it comes. He is talking now about the source of 10,000 things. He's talking about that great hidden powerful figure to which he's requesting for help and saying, I do not know from whence it comes. I know nothing about it. But I know one thing. It is the forefather of the gods. So with this statement, he puts him far above anything. Because there is God, yes. which are responsible for the seeing things, for the 10,000 th seeing things. He is the forefather. Now what is a forefather? There is a father. Yeah, <laughs> the father of the father. So, he is speaking about something very, very high here. Okay. So now I will need to start to tie it all together yes. and see where it's leading uh, towards. Um, okay. So let's do an order and see what do we have in stock. We have a person who is saying, the Tao, which we can term as the inner spirit of everything which exists, is something which is there by its lack of presence. It's there by allowance. What he's actually saying about the Tao, that the Tao is a womb. Because the only thing, um, not the only thing, but the thing which is all the time empty, it is used but never filled, are uh, cooking chambers of vessels that pass themselves material from one universe to another. That's the town. So the, the chamber of the womb can easily answer this description. Empty vessel, it is used but never filled. This is a portal. The portal. I think it's a nice, it's a nice uh, 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 thing. Um, so it's, 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 it's actually a, a portal which transmutes things from one way, uh, mode of existence to another. Yes. From the seen to the unseen, or from the unseen to the seen. You can say that our st stomach is also a kind of a towel, in that, that it is an empty vessel. It's never filled, but it's used. So the thing is, um, you can look at these two from the wish to fill it. Of, you can look at it from the standpoint of wishing to leave it empty, where it's most valuable. Uh, obviously, the male dominant aspect is to wish to fill this womb because the emptiness of the Tao is threatening upon him. <laughs> okay. Now, we live most of our lives hating the emptiness of the stomach. And we wish to come to a point where our stomach is all the time full. When we, you don't have a perception of the town, then you look at everything which is empty as a threat, as something that can swallow you, something you can fall into. The higher perception, of course, is a chamber through which life can appear. A portal, or maybe actually a better example, I don't know if you saw Star Trek. I saw it. Well, in Star Trek, they have that platform in the ship yes. in which figures from one universe come and appear 
yeah. on that platform and then come into the ship or if you want to leave the ship you go there and then you disintegrate so this is a Tao it's a kind of existence that allows appearance and disappearance and it's great value by the fact that it's empty so I can give another example the mind of a poet it should never be filled with poems because it should be a portal which the poems that wants to be created true to the freshness of now that's amazing and um, he doesn't know one day what poem he will write the next day but there's something coming and it's starting to appear and it should give it birth yes. and in fact the, the, this is the way to look at life not only by being born but also the whole existence of the planet of this part of the universe of creation and human beings is actually a vessel which is empty it needs to be used but never to be filled Okay. So we have here a statement about the Tao. We have, you see, the second sentence is not connected at all to the first sentence. Hmm. It's interesting. He's saying the Tao is an empty vessel, it is used but never filled, and he leaves this sentence and then he, he goes to address that incredible unseen power which is going to be the dominant figure all through this verse yes. and the Tao is left as a statement mm. like um, in music you have the opening theme mm -hmm. and then you have the, the improvisation so this yeah. is the opening statement that's the main thing uh, the Tao and then he says okay that's <laughs> the whole thing which happens but now, I want to make a dialogue, kind of a prayer between me and the great power. And he goes to that great power, whatever he calls him, it doesn't really matter. Unfathomable source of 10,000 things. He's turning to great power. Great, great. Only at the end we know how great is this power. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then he's saying, listen, life is difficult. Life is shit. That's what he's saying, basically. Help me! Which is very strange, because in the opening, in the ending statement, he says, I don't know where it comes from. And it's the forefather of the gods. But help me. So this is basically um, helplessness, a great cry cry of a person that this life is too difficult for him too hard, too harsh, too masculine, too demanding and he knows that he can't change it and he's turning to great power above him this is, I would say, a, a, a piece which is written in a great breakdown moment of the author um, he knows what existence is all about he knows why we are here he knows why there is this universe he knows that everything is emptiness he knows that as we appeared, we will disappear and the emptiness will stay because the emptiness is the medium of birth and this is the place where things are born in the universe. He knows all that. He's a very wise man. But there's a lot of loneliness there and the loneliness is actually coming from, the, from what he's saying I know you are great, but I don't know who you are, I don't know what you are, I never met you, you are never present, you are only responsible for what I meet. So I am deserted. Someone sent me 
here. I know the mission. I know what it's all about, which everyone doesn't know. I know that you are the architect. You are the person who sent me here. I know what you want from here, from me. I know what I need to do here. But I'm lost. And he's saying, listen, you sent me here for a job. You don't even meet me. You don't come to say, well done, I'm with you. I know it's difficult. You're simply not there. I'm totally neglected. And I want to tell you, it is tough. I know you sent me here to do a job. And like many people who think that they should have fun and have good life and they're not interested in you they sort of go to the temple and say ah God, ah God, you know the rest of it but I know, I know you are responsible for all this and I know you can't appear here because if you will appear here everything will explode from your power you must be away and we must be lonely and we must feel a mission which we didn't know who summoned us to do, to do. And I, we don't know who, who you are who summoned us to do it. But we know that you are there behind the curtain. But it's difficult. It's so hard, so sharp. Do something. I know you've got a lot of power. To make me, my messenger, your servant, one of the few who really know what it is about and what I'm here for and what I need to do help me to make it a bit softer Well, you're actually saying that if you know what it's all about you would, you're not being prized for knowing and for being enlightened on the contrary you're that's a great statement is saying, I know what it's all about, I'm one of the few who carry the torch. And instead of giving me fantastic life and servants and respect, and the, the, the price that I get for being the real representative of this force is to be neglected, to be deserted, to have no father. My father is removed from me. And what I may, may meet here makes me miserable. So you know you're doing the job and instead of getting praise and comfort, you get misery. So it's a complaint. Justified complaint as far as I can see. And the thing that comes to mind which resembles this is the prophets in the Bible. Yes. They are exactly in the same position. They are sent by power. Yes. They don't have a clue what this power is. I mean, we would like to think that, you know, they talk with the gods. It's important to understand that this person who is a messenger of something which drives him, we can say cosmic, is living in total estrangement on both ends, yes. between the father that sent him and between the people which treat him in such a harsh way. He is an outsider. Yes. Like the final words of Jesus. Like the final words of Jesus. Eli, Eli, lama netashtani. God, God, why did you forsake me? So if he would be intimate with God, it wouldn't happen. So God is the closest thing to him and his greatest devotion is to God to something which can't help him really. So this sheds another light on his requests. He makes his request knowing absolutely well that there is no chance that God will hear him. Yes. Not even say anything that God will help him. This is just a frustrated cry. I mean, all these people that pray in synagogues and temples and mosques 
they are absolutely sure there is someone listening. Yes. And if it comes really from the heart, he will listen. He knows. I mean, his end statement, Oh, hidden deep but never present. I do not know from whence it comes. It is the forefather of the gods. And he can ask that thing, soften the glare. Yeah. He knows that. He is totally, totally deserted. He can't be part of those who go to celebrate. And they comfort each other with all the celebration of nothing, of the joy of the senses. He can't be part of it. Yet, he can't be loved by his father. His father isn't there. Yeah. So it's a tragic destiny of the cosmic hero. Yeah. And the thing that the religions and the New Age basically putting in the heads of people that if you do what God wants, God would love you. Yes. And if you do what God wants you to do, your life will be charmed. He's saying, my life is not charmed. And I know it will not be charmed. And I know that if God loves me, He wouldn't show it to me because He's not there anyway. Yeah. And it's reminding me this story that I was fortunate enough to meet by Ernest Hemingway, the old man in the sea. Yes. You know the story? Yes, of course that basically his tragic figure, he's old, everyone is laughing at him, and he's going to do the greatest mission, to bring the biggest fish. Yeah. And despite all the troubles, which is the knot, the sharpness, the glare, and the things before it becomes dust, yes. despite all what happens to him, he manages to bring the fish, but in the end, the fish has no meat on it because other fishes eat it, so he's bringing a skeleton. Would you? So it's a, it's a tragic, tragic destiny for those who really do the work. So they don't do it because they do it despite. Any tragic figure is doing things out of no options. I think that uh, <clears throat> we could have uh, could have thought about writing this uh, thing maybe uh, in a different way, without complaining, and then it would be unreal. It Absolutely, would be, uh, utopic and not authentic. Absolutely, you're so right. You're so right. The fact that such a great figure as Lao Tse allows himself to complain, says, I'm doing great work, I'm the wisest people alive, yet I'm not divorced from the little human in me. He's human. He's human, he's complaining, and that's what makes him really great. Because if you will be above, like we see the prophets and people like that who live, no, you can never stop to be human. People of greatness cannot not suffer the stupidity and the arrogance and the aggressiveness of their to their life. And the fact that he allows himself human makes him a really amazing figure. Yes, and a big heart, I think, maybe. Yes. That's, I think, truly fantastic and incredible. Yeah, I must say that uh, this was a journey. Um, I'm talking now to the people who see this piece. Um, I don't know if I will finish the interpretation of all the Tao Ching because it takes uh, about two hours each verse of about uh, ten short lines. But um, in the beginning, I, it was it was totally encrypted for me, yes. and now I think it's clear that it's open. Yes because it comes from the human aspect, from the human perspective, then from the authentic, then it has life. Yeah, I like very much what you said, that if the complaint wasn't, wouldn't be there, it would lose almost everything. 
things. Um, of course, you can look at it from the standpoint that it's a pity he complains. He wouldn't complain. It would be, you know, a great thing that he is saying. Yeah. But actually, see, uh, uh, that's what makes a, a, a big piece of writing, uh, in, in, in playwriting or, or in literature, so great that the powerful figures are also weak. That makes them human. They, that makes them real. Yes. If you you have cheap fiction, then those who are good are good, and those who are bad bad. Yes. Which cartoon figures? And he is not a cartoon figure. He's a real person. See, you can look and say Tao Te Ching, like the Bible, piece of writing, someone illuminated. No, a human being wrote it. Like you and me. Yes. And the fact that he was awakened consciously made his life miserable. Because he couldn't disregard the misery, tell stories to himself. He is subject to the total truth. And the total truth causes one also to be miserable. Yes. All right, I think that's basically it. Yeah. Thank you for watching. And um, next week, I will work on verse number five, whatever it might be.